Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to talk about different methods of heat transfer and how heat can be transferred from one object to another through conduction, convection and radiation. So let's go ahead and get started by looking at these. And what we find is that there are three methods of heat transfer. These are conduction, which occurs when the transfer is by physical contact. So if you grab a hold of a hot metal pan, you will feel the heat and that is directly transferred to you because you are touching it. So the heat here in the image in the fireplace is transferred by conduction directly into parts of the house that it is touching. So in the fireplace there. Now we can also have heat transferred by convection. Convection occurs when material moves generally gases. So convection is the hot air rising up through the chimney would be heat being transferred by convection. It is heating the air and the warmer air is less dense and therefore rises through the atmosphere. Colder air would then sink. You can see cold air by the window and doors would then sink down lower and be heated up by then heated by the fireplace. But convection would be that would be the colder air denser sinking down. And finally, you can have heat transfer by radiation. Radiation is when you have the fire and you warm your hands in front of it without directly touching it. So of course, you don't want to stick your hands in the fire. But if you warm your hands in front of the fire, it is the radiated heat from the fire that you are feeling that is warming you. So you can transfer energy in three different methods here by conduction, by convection, or by radiation. So let's look at this in a little more detail starting with conduction. Conduction again is a transfer of kinetic energy. It is a direct transfer from the molecules. So you have high energy molecules and it strikes a cooler molecule and that will then heat up an object. So here it heats it up. They meet at the surface and this one ends up transferring energy cooling off the higher temperature side. Now it is moving slower and heating up the lower temperature side. And remember that heat and temperature are simply measuring the motion of particles. So when particles on average are moving faster, the temperature will increase. Now, it depends the conduction transfer of kinetic energy depends on several things. It depends on the difference in temperatures. So a higher temperature difference, and you will be able to transfer energy faster. It depends on the cross sectional area. So what over what area are you connecting these higher and lower temperature objects? If it's a smaller area, then it will take a longer time for the heat to transfer. If it's a bigger area, you'll be able to transfer the transfer the heat more effectively. How thick is the material? So how how much of a distance does it have to travel? If it has to travel only a very short distance, then you will transfer the heat faster. If you have to transfer a long distance, then it will take a longer time to calculate that or to transfer it. And here it depends on the coefficient of thermal conductivity. That is the K in our equation. Everything else we've already looked at where Q is the heat, T is the time, and A is the area that we talked about. T2 and T1 are the temperature, so the temperature difference. And the thickness of the material, D, here in the denominator. So we can use all of those to then calculate the changes that will occur. So we can look at it again here. And these coefficients are given in table 14.3. Again, if you need them for one of the problems. But we can look at a little bit of this here. And we can see that this kind of demonstrates that you have one object, T2, hotter, a cooler object, T1. And they're connected. And they're connected by something with a cross-sectional area of A. So the bigger that area, the quicker the heat can be transferred. They, there is some distance between them. And again, the smaller that distance, the quicker the heat can be transferred. And this has some thermal conductivity. That's what we have to know. We can look that up in our table here. 
And then we know the temperature difference. This is at one temperature. This is at a lower temperature. And we would then know the temperature difference. And we can then calculate the heat transfer rate. Let's go ahead and look and do an example of this. So if we do a sample problem, let's look at a styrofoam box that has a total area given of 0.95 square meters. The walls are two and a half centimeters thick and they it contains ice and beverages that are all at zero degrees Celsius. How much ice will melt in one day if it's kept at a car trunk at 35 degrees Celsius? So let's go ahead and put down our numbers that we know here. And what we have, we have the areas, the temperatures, the distance, and the time. So what's our next step? Well, let's go ahead and get our equation here. And our equation is the amount of heat is equal to, and we put all the numbers in here. This is the equation that was given previously here. And you can also rearrange that if you just want to solve for heat directly. But really remember what we're looking for is the amount uh, we're going to be looking for is the amount of ice that melts. So we're going to have to calculate the heat that is needed first, the heat transfer, and then we'll be able to turn that into a mass. And we can do that through the latent heat of fusion as the ice melts. Remember that the ice is a solid. And in order to convert it into a liquid, we would have to calculate that using the latent heat of fusion that we discussed in a previous lecture. So that amount of heat is equal to the mass, which we're looking for, times the latent heat of fusion. So if we go ahead and put our first portion in here, uh, we'll calculate the amount of heat that is needed and we just take all of our numbers. If we look up K, we find it has a certain value here in this case 0.1 joules per second per meter per degree Celsius. And then we know that the area we're given that 0.95 square meters, we can calculate the temperature difference, we can look at the uh, distance the thickness of the walls note that we did have to convert two and a half centimeters into meters in order to use it so again always look at the numbers in the units and you're going to want to generally convert into the standard SI units if you're given something in centimeters for example and then of course the number of seconds in a day 86,400 so we know all of those numbers. We can now calculate the heat, which is 1.15 times 10 to the sixth joules. And now we know that the mass is equal to that heat that we just calculated divided by the latent heat of fusion, which we know we can look up in the textbook. And that is 1.15 times 10 to the sixth joules divided by 334 times 10 to the third joules per kilogram, which gives us 3.44 kilograms worth of ice that would melt if this styrofoam box were kept in the trunk of a car at 35 degrees Celsius for one day. So it would melt nearly three and a half kilograms worth of ice in terms of heat transfer, uh, keeping the beverages at the same zero degree temperature that existed inside. So that would continue until all of the ice melts. And of course, once all the ice melts, if we have less ice than that, then the temperature of the water and the drinks would begin to rise. So let's go ahead and look at our next method of heat transfer, and that would be convection. And convection is driven by the bulk motion of matter. So how does matter move? It means that the material is actually moving. So when we look at conduction, as we looked at earlier, that was directly from direct transfer from things that were in direct contact. Here we are looking at gases and a typical furnace will be a hot, hot air furnace, which will cause heat up the air, cause hot air to rise. And then as it goes out into the room, it's slowly cooled, sinks down and goes back towards the furnace to be heated again. And that keeps the room will keep the room warm. So it's hot air being forced through the room through convection. So it is driven by forces of buoyancy, which means that hot material will rise 
and cool material will sink. So you end up getting convection cells that occur here, hot air rising up, transferring across the room, cooling off as it releases that heat into the room as it collides with the air mole as the air molecules collide. The cooler air then less uh, more dense sinks down and travels back along towards the furnace. Now we can do example of calculation with this as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at one here. And if we have a house with the dimensions of 12 meters by 18 meters by 3 meters and that the air is replaced in 30 minutes. So it takes that long for the air to circulate through. And we want to calculate the heat transfer rate to warm the incoming cold air by 10 degrees Celsius. So as we do, we put up our numbers that we know. We know the uh, volume of the house 12 by 18 by 3. We know the temperature change that we're trying to achieve. And we know the amount of time involved 30 minutes would be 1800 seconds. So we know if we have to find now the mass of the air, which is the density times the volume. And we know the density of air. Again, something that can be looked up. Uh, we can get that and we can know the volume of the house. We can say then that the mass of the air is 836 kilograms. Uh, so we have 836, ki 836 kilograms is the mass of the air. And we can then use our heat formula that we've used before. Q is equal to M times C times delta T to be able to calculate the amount of heat. And that would be equal to 836 kilograms, which is the mass we determined, times the one the specific heat, which is 1000 joules per kilogram degree Celsius times 10 degrees Celsius, which is 8.36 times 10 to the sixth joules. So that's the amount of heat that is transferred. And we're not quite done yet. We still have one more step because we're looking for the heat transfer rate. And that's where the time comes in. So we take the heat that we've determined here. That's the total amount of heat. But it has to be done in a certain amount of time. In this case, 1800 seconds. And when we divide those, we get 4.64 uh, kilowatts which would be the joules per second. So when we divide those two, we would then get the certain number of kilowatts that would occur. That would give us the heat transfer rate to be able to heat this house. How many kilowatts would you need? Now the final type that we want to look at, the final type of heat transfer is radiation. Uh, energy of radiation is is the energy depends on the wavelength of of the light. So when we note a flame, something like the flame here, we have blue down at the bottom and it gets goes from an orange into a red up at the top. The longer the wavelength, the lower the amount of energy and red light has lower wavelengths than blue light. So the hottest part of the flame is that down at the bottom. The very blue is going to be the hottest portion of the flame and the red is going to be the coolest portion of the flame. The rate of the heat transfer is determined by this energy and really by the then by the color of the radiation. So the rate of the heat transfer by radiation, what is able to absorb heat by radiation most? Well, something that is black in color is going to be the most effective and something that is white is least effective in terms of doing this. So if you have two cars sitting out in the summer, a black car and a white car, they're both going to get hot, but the black car is going to be better at absorbing that radiation is, is going to heat up more. So if you have a black car with a black interior, it's going to be the most effective at gathering that light and is going to be the hottest inside. A white colored car with a light colored interior is going to be the least effective, is going to re reflect most of that radiation back out. And we also have what we call an ideal radiator. A perfect radiator is something that will appear black because it is absorbing all of the light that strikes it and emitting light only depending on its temperature. 
And here on Earth, most things are rather cool if we're not talking about things that are heated to really high temperatures. Most things are actually going to appear black or radiating in an ideal manner. So the black surface of a table, for example, would be a good example of an ideal radiator. So let's continue looking at this and we want to look at and look at the example here. You know, when we looked at, I talked about the black and the white colors. Well, something that is black, most of the energy is going to be absorbed and very little is going to be reflected. When we look at oh, something that is silver coated or white coated, most of the light is now going to be reflected away and very little of it is going to be absorbed. When we talk about the radiation, the black is the ideal radiator. Very little of the heat is retained, very little of that energy, and most of it is being radiated away as compared to the object that is silver coated. Now, in order to calculate with this, we need to get the Stefan Boltzmann law of radiation, which tells us the rate of heat transfer by radiation. So remember the rate of heat transfer is Q divided by T and it depends on these three things here. It depends on sigma, which is the Stefan Boltzmann constant given here. A, the area. E is the emissivity talked about down here, which is depends on the specific substance. An ideal radiator, which we call a black body, would have an emissivity of one. And it depends on the fourth power of the temperature. So it is extremely temperature dependent, meaning that a very small change in temperature can result in a very large rate of heat transfer. So the transfer again is now given if you want to look at the net rate if we look at a difference in temperatures between two objects. This is the same equation we looked at before so sigma E and A are all the same. And then if we're just looking at the difference in the temperatures but again it's the fourth power so you are raising them to the fourth power meaning extremely extreme sensitivity to temperature changes. And of course the net transfer is always going to be from hot to cold. So energy will not spontaneously go from something cold to colder to something hotter. It will always go from hot to cold. So let's go ahead and look at one example with this. And what we have is what is the net rate of heat transfer uh, with an unclothed person in a dark room with a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. If skin temperature is 33 degrees Celsius, surface area of the person is about 1.5 square meter, and the emissivity of the skin is about 0.95 in the infrared. Now we're looking for talking about a person and what kind of radiation a person is emitting. We emit infrared radiation. That is based on our temperature. We see each other through reflected light. But if you turn off all the lights, you don't see another person standing there next to you unless you happen to be wearing night vision goggles. If it is completely dark, they are invisible. Why? The light that they are emitting is infrared and your eyes are not sensitive to that. So let's go ahead and put our numbers up here. And note again, we've converted uh, the values of Celsius into Kelvins. So those have been converted. And we can go ahead and complete the calculation now. So we put our equation up that we've looked at previously. We know all of our values here. We can put those, plug those in for sigma, for the emissivity that we were given the area and the two temperature differences. And when we go ahead and calculate this now, we find out that it is 99 joules per second. And note that it's negative transfer. So it is a, a negative transfer of heat from the person into the room. You're warming up the room. The room is not warming up you because your temperature is what is higher. And that would be the same as 99 watts of 99 watts. So joules per second again is a watt. So we have that uh, again as our answer. 99 watts worth of energy that is being transferred. That is the rate of heat transfer that is occurring. 
Now our last section that we want to look at today in this lecture would be talk briefly about the greenhouse effect and then we'll look at some problem solving steps. So this depends on the emissivity of the earth but the emissivity of the earth is not something easy to determine. There's an average value which is about 0.65. But remember that it depends on colors. Dark colored surfaces will have a much lower emissivity, much higher emissivity, and dark color, light colored surfaces will have a much higher one. So the more clouds, the more reflectivity we have, and the more energy that is, uh, the more ref more energy that is escaped that tra that does not reach the Earth's surface. So on Earth, our temperature is a balance between the incoming solar radiation and energy radiated by the Earth. So all energy comes in from the sun and it comes in in the ultraviolet, the visible and the infrared. So it has a variety of different colors that come in here. And then the Earth being at a much cooler temperature than the sun radiates infrared radiation. And that infrared radiation is radiated back into space. However, there are molecules like carbon dioxide and water, which are very effective at absorbing infrared radiation and keeping it trapped. So in effect, this actually the greenhouse effect is very important for life on Earth because it keeps temperatures about 40 degrees Celsius higher than they would be. And that means it makes life on Earth possible that if the greenhouse effect did not exist, the Earth would essentially be frozen and there would be no possibility of life on Earth. So it is a careful balance. We need a specific amount of the greenhouse effect. If you have too little, it'll be too cold. If you have too much, it can be too hot. But a, cer but a certain amount and the way the greenhouse effect works, it does make life possible here on Earth. So let's go ahead and look at our problem solving strategies here. And what it says is that you want to examine the situation. What is the type of heat transfer? And we looked at examples of each of the three conduction, convection and radiation. And we saw that they solve through different different equations and different methods. We identify what we're given and what is unknown. What are we looking for? What are we trying to find? And we solve the appropriate equation for the quantity that we're looking for. Uh, we looked at the different equations. Remember, there was one for conduction, one we used for convection, and one we used for radiation. And we did our examples in the lecture today. And then, of course, we substitute our values in to determine the answer and think about the answer. Make sure it is reasonable, as we've discussed before. So let's go ahead and finish up with our summary here. And we talked about the three methods of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. We said that heat transfer had a different method, different ways to be calculated in each case. And then we talked briefly about the greenhouse effect on Earth and how that shows transfer by radiation, effectively keeping the Earth warm enough for liquid water and life to exist. So that concludes this lecture on heat transfer. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.